Scott is a wounded warrior. He served the Army for 22 years, six deployments to Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, his last deployment, he was injured, severely injured, burned with three quarters of the body, massive trauma to him with uh, both shoulders and lots of part of him. He'll give you the, the, the rundown. Uh, we're very honored to have Scott here. Pay attention to what he's going to say, it impacts all of us. Sir? Thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, congratulations. Um, it's an honor for you, and, and I'm proud to be a part of it, to be present to see this for you. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Mike and Mike and uh, York Barbell for uh, Kettlebells for Warriors and having me here today. And Wounded Warriors is a great organization, and um, it's really brought me a, a long way in my life. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about my story and what they've done for me now. Um, pretty much today I stand before you a changed man. Um, everybody remembers where they were September 11, 2001. Were you on your way to work? Were you at home sleeping? Were you watching TV as the planes flew into the Twin Towers? I was stationed in Minnesota with the 13th Psychological Operations Battalion, an airborne unit. And at that moment, I knew we were going to war. The see, my soldiers, I was active duty. Stationed at Fort Bragg, but assigned to reserve in Minnesota. So I'm taking reservists downrange. And they're most important because they're the main body, heart, and soul of our service today. National Guard. I get ready to go. And I'm on my sixth deployment. And I've got this dark cloud standing above me. I don't understand it. It doesn't feel right. You ever get that pitted feeling in your stomach that today's not a good day? That's what I had. I've already done five deployments. And I'm with a new unit. I just got back from Afghanistan. And this unit's never been employed at all. To make it a little worse, we have to backfill the unit by half of other units out of the country. So as any service member would know, taking a unit down range, not having that cohesion, not having that camaraderie is a little bit tough. But as an NCO with 20 years in service, I was a leader. I led from the front. I made sure my soldiers were trained and I made sure that I would never task them to do anything that I would not do myself. So I'm ready to go. I'm going downrange. 28 days before I fly out, I get a phone call from my brother. He says, Scott, you got to come home. Your dad's about to die from cancer. So I lost my dad 28 days before I left for Iraq. For three days I watched him pass away. The next day I didn't take any time to mourn. I flew right back to my unit. Why? Because I'm an NCO. Mission first. That's why I've always been taught on day one. January 26th, 1986. So I get back to my unit. I report back to my first sergeant. My first sergeant says, I got good news for you. You're out of here. You're taking advance party over. Roger that. Well, I'm leaving on September 11th. A day with a dark cloud above it. So this deployment keeps hitting me in the face over and over again with bad things. At 20 years now I'm starting to think that maybe it's not worth it. But I go because that's my job. That's what I signed up to do and that's what I've done for 20 years. On well, January 26th, 2007 is my alive date. And the live date is the day that changed my life for everything because that's the day that I was injured and I survived. But they call it a live date because that's the day we were reborn, that we, you know, lived through our disaster, our tragedies. And on that day, on a routine convoy, my vehicle hit two anti-tank mines with white phosphorus. Now I'm sitting in the passenger seat behind the front 
passenger in a Humvee over the fuel tank. Normally we wouldn't have anybody in that seat because it's the seat for the gunner to drop down into in the event of an emergency, a rollover, or an attack. But that day we were going to cover down on two missions and knock them out, so we loaded vehicles heavy. When my driver swerved to miss a pothole, my tire hit that hole. Same the vehicle six feet into the air, coming down, thankfully on all fours, and rallying the heck out of me. It's just like the movies. Everything is in slow motion. Everything's all messed up. You're not sure where you're at? I'm looking out the window trying to find out what happened to the vehicle in front of us. And I realize I am in a vehicle in front of us. Then I know as black smoke start bellowing out of the radio as the engine. Everybody gets out. I don't remember getting out. I didn't get out. One thing that I was trained on in Dix, and everybody received the same training, and the only thing that stuck with me was this one colonel said, more soldiers today are dying in vehicles due to fire because they cannot undo that combat safety lock that's on the inside of that door. It's a lock designed to keep people out, protect us from them going through town, opening the door, throwing their grenade, or just shooting you. For some reason, I was able to undo it. My team, my unit, they got out, they set up security, they can conduct accountability. They noticed I wasn't there. They noticed the vehicle was on fire, and there I sat in the back seat of the vehicle. They ran over, set up security around that vehicle. They opened the door. Bad idea. See, I was covered in diesel. Not to mention the fuel tank being full, there was two five-gallon cans of diesel behind my seat, behind the wall from a convoy two days prior. So as soon as that oxygen came in when that door opened, I went up like a candle with the rest of the vehicle. I immediately fell out. I jumped up and started running around. I was screaming. I remember. I don't know if I was in pain, but I know I was screaming. I've been a firefighter for 13 years. Everywhere I've been stationed, I volunteered in the town I lived in. Subconsciously, constantly, I told myself, hey, you idiot, stop, drop, and roll. We teach kids every day in school. It only works when you roll on top of it in the sand, but when you cover it in diesel, as soon as that oxygen hits it again, you go right back up. So I got up on my knees and said, hey, you've got to get this stuff off you. You're carrying eight more magazines worth of rounds, four hand grenades, two smoke grenades. So I started doing the strip. I took off my Kevlar, my IBA. I took off my left glove. I took off my right glove. The right glove didn't come off like the left glove. It started coming off in pieces. One finger at a time, maybe a string at a time. And again, it was like the movies, a horror movie, nothing but red and blood. So I freaked out. I jumped up and started running again. One of my soldiers came and did a football tackle on me. The motor started coming running over, put me on the fire extinguisher. They bagged me, put me on a gurney, put me into a Humvee. And my medic and three combat lifesavers started treating me. I'm still screaming out I'm on fire, and they're sitting there going, hey, everything's pretty much burned off, and we've cut the rest off. Well, the problem was, is I had a 9mm holster that slipped right behind back here, and they didn't notice it when they transferred me. And it's melting into my leg. And it's loaded. So they immediately found that, cut it off, got it outside the door. I'm into my third round of morphine, hey, Scott's feeling good. But I'm still screaming because the white phosphor still continues to burn. So you eliminate all the oxygen from it. The medevac helicopter arrives, lands, they gurn me again, they get me out to it. It's been two and a half years since I've been injured, almost three years. And I've received over thousands of pieces of mail, letters, cards, from people, friends, family, people I don't even know, just saying thank you. Thank you for doing my job. And I've only read one of them. 